Thank you, Chair. Good. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. McCabe. You said that um, you hope to double the current number of staff, which is at 160. So you hope to double that to 320. Okay. But did you not say the Grant Thornton Review said the staffing levels were 180? Is that adequate or is that... that that's the number of additional staff oh, additional. that they're looking at that's at fine. a minimum. They, they actually, their, their report actually uh, uh, examined the, the work that they think would come from the Department of Justice, even though they couldn't be certain about it. And okay. we still can't be certain about that. But, but the recommendation said, if, if, is the if next... Their, if their assessment was correct, they were looking at it, okay. us. Okay. Uh, well, can you give us a brief outline of what a complaint, how a complaint process works? Well, I'll ask Peter. Whoever, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll ask P Peter, our director of operations, because he's, he's the man. As brief as, but for the public interest. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, uh, complaints come in from from any citizen in the country, um, and they go to an admissibility process. So we receive them in several different ways, as you know from our website. We have 14 different languages by which complaints can be made online. They can phone in, they can email in, or they can visit our office. Um, we take the complaint down. It goes through, it's entered on our case management system. It then goes through an admissibility process. So even though in 2022 we would, we'd 1,826 complaints, um, I think it was 906 of them were admitted. Um, so they would go on then for further investigation. Um, once they're admitted then we have to decide, are we looking at a potential criminal offence or a disciplinary offence? Um, and depending on which would be then it would enter the different process within the organisation. And how long does the first instance to check admissibility take, usually? We've had some struggles there with the staff numbers, um, but the receipt of the complaint will be very quick. If we, we get any indication from the complaint that it may be a criminal offence, it'll be done very quickly because we're on a clock for gathering evidence. So the first month, if we want to gather things like CCTV, um, we need to process that very quickly so the team pick out what they feel might be a criminal offence and pass it on very quickly then to the investigation staff. It's designated then by a deputy director as an investigation. So then we have the powers, the same powers as police would have to investigate once we've designated a criminal investigation. If it's disciplinary, it may take a bit longer or if we feel there mightn't be something and it won't, it won't actually be admissible, we will put that lower in the pack. So um, we would always have... Um, some backlog of admissibility complaints, um, but we're striving to get that number down. And is there is there a timeline for the complainant in relation to making complaints? Yeah, 12 months. 12 months. Yeah. So yeah. obviously criminal complaints tw made 12 months after an event are very difficult then very, regarding... G yeah. yeah. Well, we have 18 months for a statute part. Um, if but it's for video offense, evidence or anything, obviously. It's very difficult yeah. to get and, and is it And would it not be necessary then to reduce that timeline or...? Um, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's a judgment call, really. Um, are most we, people aware that it's 12 months? Yeah, and most people would come in well before the 12 months. Okay. We find it challenging when people come in 11 months later and then you're trying to gather, uh, gather evidence from something, an event that happened okay. 11 months prior to well, that. I suppose it's, it, people, you, you would hope it's not a simple thing and they do consider it maybe after the 11 months they feel there is no option, but... Either way, it needs to be timely. Yeah. And some people might wait to see if there's going to be um, a charge against them, possibly by, by the guards for... First. Um, yeah, and they might wait, be waiting for that process to finalise and then they'll come to us. OK. And just in relation to the... Is it strictly... Uh, do you have any con any complaints mechanism to deal with the policing authority or is it just on Garda Shia you don't, you don't You don't involve yourselves with the policing authority? If there was a complaint made, for instance, against a commissioner or assistant commissioner, it's not GSOC. No. So, therefore, the maladministration, or as some would refer to it, of the Dublin riots would not be GSOC's issue. Wouldn't be an issue for GSOC at all. Uh, unless somebody comes and makes a complaint to us concerning the conduct of, gar of, of the Gardaí. Of the member of the Gardaí. But with regard to the presence of Gardaí or anything to do with the administration of Gardaí in Rota for that event has nothing to do with GSA. Commissioner. Yeah, the Act actually excludes the general administration of Garda Shikona. Is, is, it an, is it admissible as a complaint? The Act actually prescribes that. Okay. That might be something we have to look into separately then with the Department of Justice on that, Chair. So, uh, just to ask then, 
If, if, like, there was a very, it was significant that there were over 50% of the complaints deemed to be inadmissible. Are there repercussions for complainants who make frivolous or vexatious complaints? Because there certainly are for the Garda member. Whether or not it's found to be true or otherwise, I think it's a very stressful time for the member, but... Is there any action taken by GSOC with regard to those complaints? Well, for, firstly, I, I have to say is that uh, sometimes people do make repeat complaints and they aren't admissible because they're out of time or ah. there's some other reason uh, and they come back with more complaints, but they can be genuine, so there's no... No, no, I asked about vexatious. Oh, well, in terms of... But it's determining if they are vexatious. So for frivolous, we, we, can, we will uh, rule inadmissible if they're frivolous or vexatious. The frivolous would be something like they complain about a guard's got dirty boots, something low-level that we wouldn't take care of. Fixatious is where there's, there's some degree of malice behind it. So if, if we assess that there is a degree of... Uh, intent to cause the guard harm or it's not genuine, then yes, we can exclude a complaint because it's vexatious. Uh, and we can do that at the admissibility stage or we can do that at, when we gather a bit more evidence. And we do that by and large. The, the greatest reason we close complaints is in that stage where we, uh, we've done an assessment and we find there's no case to answer. Uh, in terms of the individual, uh, clearly whenever, uh, uh, if, if we were to identify that beyond just uh, malign, there was, there was actual lie to GSOC, then we have a power under the Act uh, to take criminal prosecutions or to, to, to commit a criminal investigation into, into that. Now, and, and uh, since uh, uh, we've informed, we've done that on 12 different occasions. Six of them are related to Garda members, and six of them are related to members of the public who we believe uh, 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 were untruthful with us. So six Garda members made untruths in a complaint? Potentially. Right. We investigated, we investigated right. and, and six members of the public. Uh, and there's, uh, the outcomes of those uh, in that uh, two Garda members, the cases were dismissed to court. And for the four members of the public, they were all convicted and one was overturned in appeal. And there are currently six cases still working their way through the criminal justice system. Okay, but they are all matters decided by the DPP. And when would those 12 have been reported over what timeline? Back that's, as over, far as? Uh, that's over about a 10 year period. <coughs> ten year. So it's very, it's a very small. It is, but the, I mean, we take it would ha we have to be very uh, sure about taking forward members of the public, uh, for prosecuting them for giving false information, because we wouldn't want to be seen that that be our primary function. I understand. Okay, and just I was looking at the, when it when we look at what level of complaints you're handling and the staff, what impact is resourcing having on timelines and complaint handling? Peter. Yeah. We, we've we obviously mapped out our complaints and in January 2022 we had 1,138 uh, investigations um, that dropped in January 23 to 740 and that dropped again in January 24 to 590 um, the reason for that is that we, we have started to um, improve our business processes internally we've prioritised what type of investigations need to go to the commission and we've delegated authorities through the organisation for lower level cases. We've devolved decision making and we've set up some specialist units, a digital forensic unit and some specialist um, children interviewers. Um, and we've had some small increase in investigators. So that has allowed us to bring down the number of live investigations, despite the fact that the number of admissible complaints has increased. So in 2022, we had 904 but in 2023, we had 962. So we've had an increase in admissible complaints, but a decrease in investigations. We've also had a decrease in the median time to investigate. So in our criminal cases, in 2022 was 366 days, the median, and that's dropped to 224 in uh, 2023. In our disciplinary cases in 2022, we had a median of 320. That's dropped in 2023 to 220. 87% um, of our cases are now within two years. So um, From start to finish. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, well, current, in the current case law, mm. they'd be within two-year period. So it's considerable progress over the last 18 months to two years. Okay. Have you seen, do you do KPIs? Not for, um, 
not for investigation timelines other than medians. Um, okay. we, we do on our casework side, um, but the investigations are so different in nature and complexity, and um, we wouldn't um, and we would know what timelines it's taken, but we wouldn't be able to set a KPI because the investigations are so different. Do you, <coughs> do, you do you as a general uh, comment find that the Gardaí cooperate with GSOC? They, Has that any, or if they don't? Is it an impact on the timeline, obviously, but do you find that they do or they don't? They, in general, they do. Um, we have a small number of cases where we might be waiting for information um, longer than we would have, have liked, um, and we may have members who um, we would find difficult to meet them if we need to do a caution interview. We have to set up a date often with our solicitor. The solicitor may become unavailable or the member might be unavailable. That can take a while, but... Uh, by and large, they do cooperate. Okay, so it's a small, it's on the lower scale yes. rather than okay. Um, I I will say I did have an incident uh, that came to my attention whereby a complaint was passed from GSOC, GSOC to be investigated by the local guard whereby the guard that was put forward wasn't even mentioned in the complaint. So when there's like like that to me is something that not only would it hold up and like it's a complete mix-up. If you put, if a guard has been investigated that hasn't even been mentioned by the complainant, other guardy were. But in this instance, the guard that was investigated wasn't mentioned. And how do you deal with that? Even though, like I, I regard that now as something that would be obviously the complaint then becomes inadmissible with regard to this guard. But how do you deal with that? In our local intervention process, so we have an informal process where if it's a very low level, service level complaint, we would give it back to the guards and an inspector would deal with that. But it would be in relation to the named guard in the complaint. So if there's another guard where they find a wrongdoing, they should be coming back to us with that. Um, there's a section 94.1, which is an unsupervised investigation. Um, that goes to a superintendent to investigate. Again, it would be a service level complaint, but of a little higher level, and it's um, within the legislation that we would do that. And then we, we have a tier above that again, where we have a supervised investigation, where we would supervise that investigation. But in all cases, we should know the identity of the guard. And if there's any investigation that happens within and Garda Shikana that uh, brings up another wrongdoing by a guard, they should be coming back to us. And so if a complainant comes to GSOC and says, I don't know the guard's name, does that happen? It does. Or do they have to know the guard's name? That does happen, and in the new bill, that's something that is specifically mentioned, that we, we can investigate even where the guard member identity isn't known. Yeah. But, yeah, so th th that didn't, that wasn't the case here. It just happened. So it was, as I say, put to bed, but I just think it's, it's not helpful. You know, I mean, it, it needs further, or it warrants further investigation, particularly on behalf of the member having their name cleared. But it should be the case of how was she identified, you know, if she yeah. was never named. Yeah, because we, we can open public interest investigations where there's no complaint at all. Um, so um, if, if we find that... Um, I know, but that would be... That would per, yeah. Yeah, 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 it wasn't... A, like, it wouldn't have been... I'm just talking about when it comes back into the actual local. It's a bit like, you know, it's not really satisfactory that the guards are investigating the guards. And I'm sure you feel the same about that. But, yeah, and, like, that system, to me, just is, is open to all types of gives rise to all types of issues, such as I just mentioned. So um, I want to just ask you in relation to the staffing, the range of employees and their benefits. Like, it would appear that 90% of your spending, or maybe even higher, is on salary or wages. So you've got 18 staff at the lower level, between 60 and 70,000 just, but you've got... Um, it doesn't actually go, it just, it, it doesn't give the numbers of the staff that you have. If you look at the range of employees and their benefits, it just, I think that, is that just outlining the new employees for 2021 to 2022? I think it's um, the uh, note three. Um, that would be showing uh, the remuneration of <coughs> any staff who received more than 60,000 
in the year. So there, uh, I think the other staff members would be Our on lower capacity. levels of remuneration. Okay, yeah. that's fine. That's what I couldn't figure out the lack of figure yeah, when it came to 160 employees. Thanks, Seamus. How many of your staff are on secondment or, or any? Or and do you have seconded staff? We have GSAC. had a number of seconded staff at the moment. We don't have any staff on secondment. And do you have any on secondment to you? Not currently. No, so the staffing levels are as they are. There, with there are staff. They don't include. That's, sorry. You okay? Yeah, okay, sure. 